Okay, so we are live. Welcome everyone. It's Friday, May 22nd. Uh, we're going to provide you with a update about the COVID-19 situation in the region. Today we'll hear from Associate Medical Officer of Health, or sorry, Acting Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Shuli Wong. We'll also have an update from Regional Chair Karen Redman, as well as a brief update from Regional CAO Mike Murray. We'll get started with Dr. Shuli Wong. Go ahead, Shuli. Thank you, Julie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so a bit about overall trends. So as testing has increased over the past month, we have uh, not seen positive cases increase at the same rate. Approximately 7% of people tested in Waterloo Region are testing positive for COVID-19. I think there's some noise. Am I the only one that's hearing noise? I've just muted the mic uh, for okay. Irene. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks. Um, there are currently 257 active cases, of which 221 cases, or 86%, are isolating at home or in their congregate setting home. And 32 cases, or 12%, are in hospital at this time. Four cases are still under investigation. That said, we are still in a precarious state. COVID-19 is still in our community and the risk to acquiring it is present throughout all of the region. We've had questions about testing and the role of public health. Hospitals have oversight over assessment and testing centers where testing is done, and they are run in partnership with clinical leadership. Public health's role is to recommend testing in outbreak situations, such as in long-term care or retirement homes. The testing would then be done by the homes at the assessment centers for staff or through mobile testing teams of the assessment centers. Public health also becomes engaged when a test is positive. We receive the positive test result and we follow up with individuals to conduct case and contact management. And in the case of an outbreak, we also work with the facility to support outbreak management. The testing centers and public health would like to encourage all residents who have symptoms of COVID-19 to be tested. A little bit more about face masks. Both the provincial and federal governments are now recommending that everyone should wear non-medical masks or face coverings when they are in situations when they are unable to maintain physical distancing even if they have no symptoms. Non-medical masks can be an additional tool to help prevent the spread of the virus because wearing a mask can help you contain your own droplets. When many people wear masks, they are helping to protect each other. When choosing a mask, look for one that is made of cloth or fabric do not use plastic or any other non-breathable materials. Uh, look for one that fits snugly with no gaps and that does not impair your vision. Non-medical masks should not be worn by children under the age of two, anyone unable to remove the mask without help, anyone who has trouble breathing or is unconscious, and as mentioned previously, medical masks must be kept for healthcare workers and others providing direct care to COVID-19 patients. And please remember that wearing a mask is not a replacement for other measures. It is not a substitute for physical distancing, hand washing, and staying at home if you start to develop symptoms, even mildly so. And finally, while wearing a mask, make sure the mask is securely fastened and avoid touching your face, 
Continue to wash your hands often with warm water and soap or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Wash your hands before putting the mask on and after taking the mask off. And please remember to continue to practice physical distancing whenever possible. In closing, while our trends in Waterloo Region have improved, COVID-19 remains a serious threat. The signs of stabilization we're currently seeing reflects the efforts of each and every person who has stayed home, who has practiced physical distancing, and who has made personal sacrifices over the past weeks and months. If we don't stay the course, we will see cases rise again in Waterloo Region. You can enjoy the nice weather while maintaining two meters between yourself and others. Consider being active during less busy times of the day and leave if an area becomes crowded. And for now, continue to only spend time with your household contacts. Only by all of us staying the course and continuing to follow the public health measures will we prevent a resurgence of COVID-19 cases. Let's continue to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. We'll now hear from Regional Chair Karen Redman. Go ahead, Karen. Thanks, Julie. Good morning, everyone. I know that it's welcome news that everyone experienced symptoms can get tested in Waterloo Region and that overall the numbers of new cases is slowing. This news is promising as things begin to slowly open up because it allows us to identify people experiencing symptoms, prevent further spread, and continue to move forward. However, COVID-19 is still present in Waterloo Region. This is why we must continue to remind you to keep two meters or six feet away from others when not at home, to avoid touching your face, mouth, nose or eyes, and to stay home if you have symptoms and to wash your hands often. These are still the best ways to protect yourself from this virus that is present in our community. I would like to echo Dr. Wong's recommendations for wearing a mask or face covering when you're not able to physically distance. Wearing a mask limits the spread of your droplets and protects others. If we all wore face masks, we would be protecting each other. You protect me, I protect you. As a caring collaborative community, I know that we can do this together. Some situations where I might consider wearing a mask to protect others include in an elevator, at a grocery store or when shopping, using transit, or in a taxi or a ride share service. As Dr. Wong noted, the federal and provincial recommendation is to wear a mask or face covering while going out to reduce the community spread of coronavirus. It is part of our new normal. If we all continue to physically distance, maintain good hand hygiene, hand hygiene and wear mask coverings to protect each other, we will beat this. I wish you all a wonderful weekend. And for those celebrating Eid al-Iftar this weekend, I wish you Eid Mubarak. Thank you. Um, it sounds like there might be an alarm going off. Yeah, so uh, there's a fire alarm happening in our building at 150 Frederick. So I think Chair Redmond and I probably, no, I actually just stopped. Okay. Stopped. So I'm gonna take that as a good sign. If it, uh, if it goes off again, then we'll have to uh, exit. Okay, we'll understand. So on that note, um, we'll now hand it over to Mike for a brief update on enforcement. Yep, so, uh, so my update will be really brief. I think we did a kind of preliminary update on Tuesday after the long weekend. So um, enforcement data for the period uh, May 12th to May 18th, so that is up to and including uh, the long, the long weekend. Uh, so we had a um, total of 97 site visits that involved um, officers issuing education or warnings to people. We had almost 600, 598 site visits where no action was required because either situation had resolved, it wasn't a violation. Uh, we had, um, I think, 
we, ha we had 13 phone calls. This is only to public health. And so I think we're actually going to stop reporting on phone calls because they're not being tracked comprehensively across all of our enforcement partners. So in total, uh, about 700 uh, compliance um, checks, monitors, um, and no new charges laid over that period of time. So happy to take any questions about that or other things. Okay, thank you, Mike. And thanks to all of our presenters. We'll now turn it over to you for questions and we'll start with Joanna. Go ahead, Joanna. Thank you. Uh, just a question for Dr. Wong. Mm -hmm. uh, Fortis said that he wants everyone pretty much tested whether they have symptoms or not. So what's your response to that? Like the, he really just wants testing to, to ramp up even more. Uh, yeah, so um, our testing partners who run the assessment and testing centers, they are following the direction and guidance that has been given by the province at this time. So um, the guidance that has been given by the province at this time is to test anyone with symptoms. And so I am sure that they'll continue to follow the direction and guidance uh, by the province as it uh, continues to be updated. And are you expecting that to change then after Ford has said this? Uh, yeah, well, we will have to wait and see what comes out from the province. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, I'm sure the assessment testing centers will follow that guidance. All right, that's my questions for now. Thanks. Thanks, Joanna. We'll move on to Kate from CBC. Go ahead, Kate. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wog, I'm just wondering, uh, there's been a lot of talk in the past few days of a second wave. Um, mm. We've talked about it before, but in particular, they're talking about it now and, and looking at September, October. Um, what kind of conversations are public health having with the other members of the health teams in regards to preparing for that second wave in the region? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, that's something that's um, being looked at uh, by the province in terms of what we might be able, uh, uh, sorry, what we might see rather uh, in, the, in, in the future. It's, um, it's hard to, to know for sure. And I understand the province will be coming out with projections again, and we'll look forward to seeing those because they obviously will help us plan as well. But I think, uh, you know, um, the health system partners uh, continue to be in regular contact with each other. And we continue to um, focus on uh, making sure that the things that we do today in terms of how we respond uh, to COVID-19 as we're in the current first wave, um, you know, the things that we're doing today can also serve uh, to inform how we do things in the future so that we can be, um, so that we can do everything that we can to try to mitigate the effects of a second wave should it occur. Um, a lot of the issues that we have encountered, I believe, have to do with system issues, um, health system issues um, and gaps in the system that were previously present and um, you know that um, have become become more apparent with COVID nineteen due to additional strain on the on the system, and so um, you know work will need to continue at that level as well uh, to try to um, to try to address those system gaps and to uh, reinforce our healthcare system uh, to be able to continue to. Um, be prepared for a potential second wave. And if I can kind of put the same question towards either Mike or Chair Redman, I mean, what kind of conversations are regional staff and regional counselors having um, given that the region has seen such a financial hit from the first wave um, and there's talk that the second wave could be worse? What, what, what are the conversations I guess that are happening? Uh, so maybe I'll start. Um, 
so, um, you know, there's been a lot of work on the response phase and we've learned a lot. We've done a lot. Um, we're now starting to work on recovery and reopening. Uh, we've got a report to regional council that's scheduled for, uh, for next Tuesday. And, you know, I think all the lessons learned through the response phase and the recovery phase, I think will serve us well if and when a second wave actually happens. You know, we've, we've learned a lot. We uh, made a lot of changes in short time. And so I think we've got models that we can use quickly if and when we need to. And if I could just add on to that, um, I think it's an excellent question and something that Council um, has been talking about and thinking about. And certainly the dynamics and the collaboration, if I look at Best WR or I look at the uh, philanthropic um, sort of one stop um, entrance way to federal funding that's been announced this week, I think those things bode well in engaging the entire community as we go forward. And I think that will be key to not only our recovery, but how we um, withstand um, with shock absorbers throughout the community for whatever the second wave looks like. Okay, thank you, I'm good. Thanks, Kate. We'll move on to Tim from 570. Go ahead, Tim. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wong. I just wanted to see if you could uh, re, re say the the opening line in your uh, in your opening sp statement uh, about the seven percent. I kind I, I missed that. We need you to unmute, Shuli. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Yes. So. Um, Yes, um, so approximately 7% of people tested in Waterloo Region are testing positive for COVID-19. Okay, and um, you, you mentioned uh, hospitals oversight for testing. So are they the ones responsible for issuing the testing themselves? Yeah, they're responsible. Um, um, they, they, they oversee the uh, testing and assessment centers, uh, the establishment of the centers, the running of the centers. Um, they do the testing and then they follow the provincial guidance uh, for you know, groups to be tested. And now uh, it's, it's all the residents who are symptomatic who are eligible. So yes, so uh, they in short have oversight over, um, over the testing. And when someone tests positive and public health reaches out to them and does follow-ups, what, what's, mm -hmm. what's the follow-up like? How, how, can you go through the steps or anything? Like what, what questions are you asking that person? Uh, so it's called uh, case, uh, case follow-up or, or case management. So, you know, we uh, get the positive results um, and we follow up with those people and we let them know um, you know, what to do uh, to um, avoid um, um, transmitting it to others as much as possible, uh, what they have to do, for example, you know, self-isolate. Um, so it's talking to the, to the individual cases and then providing them public health advice on, on what to do uh, to prevent transmission to others. Has there been any update with uh, Conestoga Meets at all about about that? About that? Oh yes. Um, so our, our our website numbers for Conestoga Meets um, are being updated every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And um, what we've seen is uh, we've seen a, a significant slowing down of the number of positive cases that are coming in, which is a good sign. Uh, so even though on our website this morning you'll see ninety one cases in total, which are associated with this outbreak, not necessarily you know, due to transmission in the plant, but that are associated with this outbreak because they have occurred among those who work at Conestoga Meats. Uh, so we have a 91 total to date of which 70 have resolved. Uh, so, so we're seeing good signs that uh, you know, there's less and less cases and that so, uh, and that, um, you know, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're seeing signs that the measures that they have put in place at the plant um, are, are having an effect. So that's, that's good. We'll continue to monitor. 
Those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. We'll move on to Bill from Cambridge Times. Go ahead, Bill. Hi, my question is for Dr. Wong. Um, Long-term care homes and retirement homes, we're seeing, it looks like from the numbers, that it's starting to flatten a bit. Um, do we do we feel that we have uh, those numbers and uh, under control? Oh, thanks, Bill, for your question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's very precarious. Uh, these are very vulnerable settings. I'm glad to see that there are more facilities that, when they go into outbreak, um, you know, they're able to contain the spread and then quickly, as quickly as possible, come out of outbreak. Uh, but it's um, uh, so I, I'm glad to see what seems to be some signs of stabilization starting overall. Um, but I, I still think it's a very precarious situation. Uh, as you may know, we're still going to be doing um, testing or offering um, entire home testing uh, to retirement homes. We had uh, started with those um, that were in outbreak and uh, we'll be offering to the rest of those over the next couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. It's still a, a situation that we have to watch carefully. Uh, it's, it's very important um, for all the homes to continue to be vigilant and they're, they're working hard on, on, at that. Um, you know, we were in conversations with a lot of them and they're doing a lot of work. Um, so really, you know, um, uh, it's it's a, it's a lot to do with the good work of the staff in those homes. So it sounds like it's a little too early to talk about maybe some restrictions from visitors being lightened, yes. but would that come from up top for would it go or could the region public health make that decision? No, that would be something that uh, would come from uh, from the province. Okay, so it would have to go provincially and not just locally then. Yes. Okay, that's everything. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Um, we'll move on to Irene from Air News. Go ahead, Irene. Hi, my question is for Dr. Wang. Um, on the dashboard, cases per 100,000 population by municipality. Is the bar chart displaying cumulative cases? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, cumulative cases, yes. Okay, so we will have no way of knowing, say for instance, North Dumfries, it's showing um, eight cases. We have no way of knowing if they're resolved. No, not at this time. Um, we know we're continuing to take requests for the dashboard. Um, so we know that's something I know people have asked for. So we're um, you know, looking into that, but we don't have that available at this time. Okay, that's my question. Thank you. Thanks, Irene. We'll move on to Damon. Go ahead, Damon. So kind of a follow up to Bill's questions about visitors um, at retirement home and long term care. Um, there's been a couple of musicians that come to these sites and perform for the seniors. Is this allowed or? Yeah, um, you know, it, there, there are there are significant restrictions uh, that are in place for uh, for for long term care homes and retirement homes currently and uh, we need to keep them in place in order to um, prevent the entry of COVID-19 into the facilities. It's still a very precarious situation for them. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's still essential visitors only. Okay, thanks. My other questions were already answered. Thanks, Damon. Uh, Rosie, we'll turn it over to you. Go ahead. Thank you. A uh, question for Mike Murray about charges. So I, thank you for the update uh, that you gave us up until the end of the long weekend. What can you tell us about charges or calls um, that the region has received since then, since May 18th? We'll figure that out eventually. Uh, yeah, I don't have a lot of detail. We've, you know, tried to update the monitoring enforcement and compliance about once a week, um, typically on, <clears throat> on Wednesdays. So next Wednesday, we'll have more detail about this week. Um, what I can say is, um, um, you know, as the weather gets better, we're seeing more um, questions, complaints, issues about, um, you know, people congregating. 
And so that's generating activity for um, all the enforcement groups. So regional bylaw, local municipal bylaw, regional public health and water region police. Um, so they're all, you know, pretty active, but again, um, you know, seeing, um, you know, people are, are relatively compliant. If they are reminded, then people, um, you know, take appropriate action. And uh, in terms of specifically things like uh, garage sales, we're starting to see some of that activity, uh, including people also putting items out on the curb for, you know, they're trying to sell things on Facebook Marketplace or Kijiji, and then they're inviting people to come by to the curb to take a look at those items. What would be uh, the guidelines or your message for people about those types of activities? Well, I would probably just reinforce um, guidelines and direction that the province has provided and the public health continues to provide, which is, um, you know, you're, you're going to anticipate what I'm going to say, which is people should, you know, practice physical distancing, stay two meters apart, um, avoid uh, gathering in groups of more than five, and practice good personal hygiene, lots of hand washing. So, you know, if people uh, continue to practice all those measures, um, as well as more recent recommendations around mask wearing, um, you know, that, that would be, I think, the guidance to um, anybody who's contemplating any of the kinds of things that you talked about. And am I able to ask Dr. Wong a, a quick question as well? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just about in regards to testing. So now that um, it's my understanding, based on what you've said during the call, that, uh, you know, now assessment centers are expected to ramp up testing now that the general population with symptoms are being tested. At what point could, would, or should the region consider going above and beyond the guidelines of the province and even testing people who could be asymptomatic? Um, so, you know, th these, these guidelines are based on um, provincial guidance which is based on expert guidance uh, so these are issues that are looked at um, by provincial experts you know what the testing strategy should be um, so I think it's important for for us locally to continue to follow um, you know the best available expert guidance on those things and so we understand that there's going to it sounds like there's going to be further information that will be provided um, in, the, in the near future about testing again. We've had updates to the testing guidelines, um, you know, over the course of this pandemic to date. So, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's to be expected that we'll continue to have updates. Um, but I think what's important is that, um, you know, we continue to follow the guidance that's given by the province at, at this time. They have the resources at the province to look at this um, through expert bodies and tables. And, um, you know, we're, that's what the assessment centers are doing. They're, they're taking the direction and the guidance from the province. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Rosie. Um, and last up, we have Kevin from Global. Uh, good morning. Um, <clears throat> my question is for uh, Dr. Wonk. Um, we've seen sort of a significant decrease in the number of people in a hospital in the last nine days. And the, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to phrase this tactfully, but the number of people who have passed has uh, slowed down as well. Why uh, can you point us to why we're seeing these trends? Uh, yeah, it has to do with the general slowdown of transmission of COVID-19 in our community due to all the measures that are put in place. Um, and mostly to, to, you know, because of the fact that people have been staying home, um, businesses have been closed, um, people are only going out, have been only going out for essential um, uh, trips, things like that. So all those measures, which are very difficult, I understand, and, and, and you know, have had significant impacts uh, society-wise, those are the measures that have allowed the transmission to slow in the region and that has led to, you know, less hospitalizations or at least not continuing, and, or at least them not continuing to, 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 to go up. 
and uh, as well, uh, a little later, we started to, um, to, to we starting now rather to see some slowdown in activity in, in long-term care homes because it was very active earlier. And whenever there's, there's infections in long-term care homes, a little while later, um, there's going to be deaths that come from it. So the more infections you have in long-term care homes, the more deaths that come later on. Uh, so yeah, it's all due to the measures that we put in place, which is which is why it's it's um, you know as Chair Redman and, and Mike and myself have been emphasizing, it's really really important that people continue to follow the fundamental measures of physical distancing. Um, you know, staying at home if you're ill, washing your hands, and now if you're going out where there's other people, wearing a mask as well. Uh, because now that we're lifting uh, measures and we're allowing the opportunity for more people to be in contact with more people, that just increases the risk of COVID-19 transmission. So those measures, um, you know, will be extremely important for us as a community to try to keep those rates of transmission low. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the overview. Uh, the only other question I have is, so there's a, the woman in Cambridge who says she's had um, 10 tests done now. Mm -hmm. uh, would, on the dashboard, would she count as uh, just one positive case or would she count as multiple? No, she, she um, in terms of cases, she's just one case. Um, she would count as just one case. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so we've gone through the line once. I just am going to have a quick look to see if anyone has additional questions. I do see a few hands up. So uh, Damon, go ahead. There we go. Oh. Oh, I think you're still on mute, Damon. Are we good? Awesome. Uh, this is for Dr. Wong. Some concerning um, information. There's an outbreak at Village Manor. They've been ordered to shut down by June 1st. Um, where will these residents go? In St. Jacob's Village Manor uh, retirement home. And, uh, no, there's, well, they're, they're operating at the moment. Um, yeah, we are working uh, closely with health system partners as well as the Retirement Home Regulatory Authority. Um, with respect to Village Manor, um, because um, you know they've had some orders from the Retirement Home Regulatory Authority, uh, so you know we are working very closely with that authority. Uh, so, so, do we have any idea what that's going to look like if they're supposed to be closing in just a little less than two weeks now? Uh, yeah, I don't know the details about the. I don't know details about the closure. Unfortunately, I, I'm, they're, they're operating at the moment. And so we are working with them at the moment um, and with the authority uh, to uh, you know, provide them the, the support uh, that they would need for outbreak management. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Damon. Uh, Kate, did you have another question? I did have just a quick one. Um, I'm just wondering what the status is of testing in the long-term care and retirement homes. You know, when we see 130 tests from Thursday to Friday-ish, mm -hmm. um, does that still involve long-term care homes or are we seeing an increase at the assessment centers? Mm -hmm. So um, I can talk about the long-term care homes. Um, so the, the, the province, as you may remember, they had directed that uh, there be one time entire home testing of all long-term home all, excuse me, all long-term care homes across the province by May, by May 15th. So that's been done. Um, and in, in our region, we are also offering that to all the, the testing partners and uh, are also offering that to all the retirement homes. Um, and we have tested a number of them that were already in outbreak, but now we're um, um, going to be offering them to the other homes in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so there was a significant increase in the number of tests done both locally and provincially 
um, you know, up to the week, up to May 15th, because there was all the testing in the long-term care homes. Uh, so since that time, there's been obviously a decrease because there's no more of that testing that's going on, except in our region, there's still gonna be some testing going on in the retirement homes. So for the numbers with respect to the assessment centers, we get those numbers from them. Sometimes it's not always on a daily basis. Sometimes they come in a little bit delayed. And so for the latest numbers, you know, you, you could ask them, but when we get the numbers then they get uploaded to our, to our website. So the numbers that you see in terms of the fluctuations from day to day shouldn't be counted on as these are exactly the numbers that were tested from yesterday to today. It's really a function of when we get the reporting from the partners and then we upload. It's a, it's a feature that we provide on our website um, like a, a few other health units do as well, just to keep people informed in, in general about, about tests. Um, but yeah, they could be a little bit out of date. Okay, thanks, Kate. Uh, Tim, did you also have a question? No, anybody else? Show of hands. Okay, um, I'm not seeing other, any other hands up, so I think that we can conclude today's briefing. Thank you all for joining us again. Uh, we'll be back here on Monday for our regularly scheduled briefing, and I hope you all have a safe weekend. Take care.